something you learned when you were born an entrepreneur? You've got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. One of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. It was <laughs>
um, and we will announce the winner. Did you at any point on that evening feel you were going to be Miss Ghana? No. Why? Um, one thing I was told, and especially um, by Maha, was go out and have fun. You know, go meet girls, meet, meet the rest of the girls, make as many friends as possible, you know, grow your network, and you're going to go to university anyway. You never know where you meet any of these girls, but ultimately have fun. Mm. And here was a girl who grew up mostly in, in Bulga. So for me, it was, it, was, it was meeting all these girls. Yes, I'd schooled in Kumasi, so I, a lot of my friends were always here, but meeting all these girls, meeting all these important people, because you know, before you get on stage and do all of that, you, you, go, you actually get camped at Labadi Beach Hotels where you meet all these important dignitaries. So for me, it was just like, oh wow, I see these people on television and I'm meeting them, I'm talking to them. I totally enjoyed all that. So yes, I gave it my best shot and I knew I could win, but I didn't go there ultimately saying I was going to win. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to enjoy the process and be part of this thing. So when I, um, my name was mentioned, if you remember, I came on stage without makeup because even though I was part of the last five, I went backstage and, you know, undressed, got ready, you know, got my stuff ready to leave, took off all my makeup because at that time it was really difficult to stay. I just didn't like the idea of makeup that much. So I, I was sitting there having a chat with my sister and somebody said, you were six, I think I was number 16, was, that's you, they're mentioning your name, you've won. I said, me? It's like, yeah, it's like, oh, we've won, we've won. Everybody started shouting, we've won, we've won. So quickly I had to put on my gown again, you know, put everything on and then come on stage, you know, do the, you know, the wave. But I think it hit, it hit me the next day. I woke up and I was like, oh my God, I am Miss Ghana, what am I going to do? I didn't come to Accra to, to carry this crown, so what do I do? You know, and that was the beginning. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Of course, you did go back to school, finish mm -hmm. your degree, and then uh, went into banking, uh, investment banking, yes, and I did. interesting <laughs> stuff. Let's let's talk about that journey. You did work with the City Group at some point. Yes, I, I actually worked with EcoBank for some time, right? And then I won the the Shevening Scholarship to go and do my MBA in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So. After I came back, I still went back to EcoBank for, I think, a year. Mm -hmm. and then I got a job with Citigroup. But the posting was in Nairobi as okay. an investment banker. So, of course, it's like, it's a new country. It's, it's Citigroup, you mm -hmm. know. So, I, I, there was no way I said no. I immediately went through the interview process. I went to Nairobi, got interviewed. And I moved out. And I stayed in Nairobi for about two and a half years as an investment bank in the corporate, uh, uh, corporate investment banking. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was interesting because you know you had to learn Swahili a little bit because they speak more Swahili than they, they do English. Mm -hmm. So I had to pick up all the words and then manage a portfolio that was totally 70% um, Kenyan to, uh, uh, top tier corporates mm -hmm. and then 30% American. Wow. So that was that was an eye opener. Wow. It was as it was like okay, this is the the, the, the real deal. So, so how did you settle in from the 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 trappings of the fame of being Miss Ghana and then suddenly going back to school, finishing working? Um, at any point, did you feel that I've arrived? This is me, and you should you should listen when I speak. In my family. Everywhere else. <laughs> oh no. First of all, it was my family okay. where what you said you would do, you would do. Mm -hmm. And I think having that support system and the fact that you needed to, you know, I couldn't let them down because this was more like a bargain. You, we would allow you to do this provided you come back and continue what you set out to do, mm. which was to go back to school. Right. So ultimately, that was my biggest, biggest um, 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 aspiration at that time. Even though, yes, I took a year off and got a job, what I wanted to do was just to learn and see, do I want to go back to school immediately or do I want to get a job? But I still wanted to go back to school because just getting the job made me realize the gaps I had. And for me to be able to achieve what I set out to do, I needed to go back to school. I couldn't just um, follow this, you know, um, Miss Ghana thing because it was just a year mm -hmm. and you have a year to decide exactly what you wanted to do with your life it's an amazing platform it was an amazing platform for me it opened doors 
I met people who became mentors. I also met people who challenged me, people who betrayed me. But ultimately, it was just the combination of all of that that got me thinking I needed to be more than just a beauty queen. Wow. So new territory, new language, new experiences. Mm. What are some of the things that um, shaped who you've become today? Um, I think being an entrepreneur today started from working with City Group, mm. where I dealt with corporates that were run by entrepreneurs who had started up businesses right from nothing to the point where they were bankable by City Group. That was for me. Every time I went, I was an eye opener because some of the um, companies or people I dealt with in Nairobi was like, oh wow, and this is these are Africans, you know, who had businesses. So they had started from their backyards, you know, and now exporting uh, products to, you know, stock all of Max and Spencer, Waitrose. And these are just businesses that were started by individuals. Mm. Why, not, why not be one of them, you know? But at least I saw exactly what they took to get to the stage where Citigroup thought they were credit worthy. And you had to start from the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, small beginnings, ensure everything, the proper structures are in place governance you know you actually get the right people on your board to ensure that you come up with a solid financial statement where a bank can come in and say okay we are ready to refinance or to restructure your balance sheet these were the things i learned and i thought okay one day if i decide to branch out of course these are the basic things i would do right from the beginning whether or not i was worth one Ghana or 100 million. I would start right from the beginning because that's how these businesses started. Wow, interesting. There's something I can't, you know, uh, overlook in, in this particular part of your story that when you went to Nairobi to take up that job, you had to learn Swahili. Swahili. <laughs> um, and, and that's because the Kenyan identity is synonymous with them. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're speaking of the, the Kiswahili mm -hmm. language. Have we as Ghanaians lost our way in terms of holding dear to our identity whenever we, we, we engage? Um, I wouldn't say we've lost it, no. We got a bit confused mm. at some point. I think slowly we're getting back to that stage where we want to own our identity. Because when you work in a place like East Africa, you can say anything about them, but they do own their own where they believe that whatever we make as East Africans is, should be made by East Africans, enjoyed by East Africans, you know. So hardly would you find people in East Africa running out of East Africa, you know, over summer because they have to travel abroad. There's just so much you can do there. In Mombasa, you've got Zanzibar. They would rather enjoy their own. So, and, but slowly we are getting there. We, did, we haven't had the opportunity to actually grow and develop our resources and we're getting there. Mm. Uh, was there a deliberate uh, attempt or plan on the part of the East Africans to um, position themselves first to their own um, as compared to what we may, I mean what lessons can we learn from the East African example? Um, well I think when it comes to development and trying to own your own it has to be intentional. Mm. It has to be because you have to set out to tell yourself that this is what we are worth this is what we deserve and this is what we should be getting. Mm -hmm. We have the resources. Everything that we decide to do as a nation should be intentional. We have to decide that as Ghanaians, we have everything that it takes to make us a world-class country. We, we should not, never look at ourselves as um, wanting aid. And I actually love the fact that we're moving you know, towards Ghana beyond aid. Because, of course, why? Bottom line is the aid ultimately is our money. It leaves our shores and, and then, then it comes it, back, it comes to, back us. to us. So why don't we enjoy that? And then we rather start offering them something. Mm. You know? So I think it's intentional. And right now that everyone's mindset is towards, okay, we need to be independent. We need to be sustainable. We need to enjoy our own. We need to develop our own. This is the direction we should all be What headed. do you make of the school of thought that this new, if we could call it awakening mm -hmm. of us becoming Ghana without aid or Africa without aid mm -hmm. is actually uh, a, 
a narrative that's been sold to us by the same people who used to give us aid because now they want to cut the aid so you know we're rebasing our economy and we're you know numbers are looking better and we're now middle income or lower middle income and so that means we have in the terms of our economic development mm -hmm. have reached uh, puberty or we've reached uh, <laughs> uh, adulthood yeah. where we need to stand on our own Born. two feet but do we have what it really takes to transition properly? We do. I think we do. We just haven't um, utilized our own resources. Mm. We do. And I think it's unfortunate that the same people are telling us to start looking at Ghana beyond aid because, of course, they want to cut, cut down on the mm -hmm. aid they, 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 they give us. But it's okay. That's fine. They can tell us. But I'm, I... I'm also of the view that they're seeing the potential we have and they see that if at some point they don't cut this, we would rise up ourselves. Mm. So better for them to do it now and then maybe take some credit that, yeah, we advise them to, to get mm. there. But we do. And we should be ready. Okay. We should be ready. I think we've got the resources. I mean, I meet Ghanaians and I'm on all these platforms and some of the ideas and the arguments, the thought processes that people put in trying to come up with solutions for this country. We need to bring all these ideas together. We I like have the it. fact that you talked about people having ideas and great thought mm -hmm. processes. Ghana is known to have great thinkers, but very few doers. How do, we how do we change that narrative? Do we have enough doers to take this revolution or renaissance to its next level? We have enough doers, we have enough. But you know, one thing I've noticed, and a lot of the platforms I'm on, and where people are a little apprehensive in coming up is because we, people still have this thing about being victimized. Mm. You know, when you come out and you publicly challenge something, um, you get victimized or you, somebody thinks, oh, this person is not for us. I think that is where we've got to make that intentional effort you know, to move away from that. And once we are able to move away and give people that clarity and the confidence that you can come out boldly, you know, with solutions, because a lot of the times countries make it not by producing anything. A lot of the countries that we are relying on for aid do not produce anything. They just offer solutions. And we've got the brains to also offer solutions. Why don't we do that? But of course, if you want a brain that offers solutions, these brains do not necessarily curtail. To, to, to things. To conventional exactly. wisdom and, they and will practices. Challenge, they will challenge issues. They will come out and voice, you know, they'll have... So at the end of the day, you need to make sure you create the environment that is conducive enough for people to come out and challenge if they, they you know, they have to challenge. They have to come out and do it. You know, you've transitioned, you know, from investment banking mm -hmm. to becoming an entrepreneur. Um, the word entrepreneurship is, Scary. <laughs> is a very interesting word. We hear it all the, all time, the time, that uh, Africa's uh, economic renaissance is going to be you know, hinged mm -hmm. on how well we harness the youth and their entrepreneurial abilities. Uh, is it an overflogged subject, or is truly entrepreneurship something we need in our collection of uh, things to throw at our problems? Totally, we need it. I think we need to teach ent entrepreneurship, yes, in our schools. Um, we need to move away from having graduates or students all perfecting their CVs to be employable. Mm. People need to work on themselves to be employees because we don't have enough jobs to absorb to all be employers. the- To No, we don't, okay. we don't. And who's retiring? Mm. The, you know, so we don't have enough jobs, so why don't we start teaching entrepreneurship and teaching our students that it is okay to come out and you know, want to be an employer, but you have to learn to start small. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you have to start small. And you, you know, we need to teach our students to think outside of the box. It doesn't matter what idea it is. Any idea would sell, provided they have the support. Mm -hmm. But do we have the, the, you know, the resources to support all of this? So instead of probably putting the resources in, it's okay to offer the access to free education and everything, but then we've got to add what then happens when they come out. Who's going to employ them? You know, the youth unemployment um, situation we currently have, 
we need to look at how we can solve that because it's adding on. Mm. Every year it's adding on. And there just aren't enough jobs to employ them. So it's, it's not enough to just educate people. No. It's, it, like, give them tools. Yes, give them uh, through tools. Through that education. Yes, give them tools. And you think entrepreneurship will yes. provide... Yes, we um, need to teach. We need to teach our youth to think of themselves as entrepreneurs, to think of themselves as employers and not just employees. Everybody, you know, you, you go to the universities, you, you, you're just about to graduate, and you have all these um, um, consulting firms that come to teach you how to perfect your CV. For what? So you can get employed mm. and everybody wants to go into the banking sector because I mean they, are, they employ who goes into public sector because already public sector is choked but then there's there's a brick it's totally the the next stage that we, we is, is it possible to have somebody teach these students um, how to go into a brick you know, and you know, agri, agri business is not about farming. Mm -hmm. You know, you, on the value chain, there are various stages that you know somebody can fit into. But we need to teach our students and to teach everybody that it is okay to get into that, because I dealt with a lot of agri business owners in Nairobi, and they are the richest in in, in, in Kenya. Mm. You know, some of these companies, homegrown, agri fresh. Mm. If you go into Max and Spencer today and you're buying vegetables, do you know they're actually pack farmed, packaged priced everything in the cold stores of Nairobi and, and shipped, shipped off yes, every day. You know, their creators leaving every day to stock MS, to stock Tesco. Flowers, this is agribusiness. And these are billion dollar uh, businesses. Why can't we do the same here? What's different in the East African um, space? Um, a lot of people say, well, government has to provide a certain enabling environment. Um, comparing the two spaces, um, do we have the same indices that allow for businesses to thrive and be creative and entrepreneurial? We don't because um, traditionally this hasn't been what we're used to. Mm. Traditionally, we, we're used to, you know, importing and selling. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it will take time. It will take time. It has to go through the process, but it has to be a, a balance where public and, and private sector has to meet. We need a, a mindset change and we need the support of the government. You know, government has to come in and actively support and make it um, open and actually make it in a way that people would love to go into that. So it will take time. We, we, won't, we don't have to wake up and expect the change to happen overnight. We you know, never started that way. We're, we're, we're two years away mm -hmm. from what was earmarked as Vision 2020. And as part of Vision 2020, you know, the whole concept of making Ghana the gateway to Africa. Um, we're supposed to develop the, 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 the free zones, enclave, mm -hmm. do some agribusiness, do some manufacturing. We now have this new paradigm or this new mantra, Ghana without aid. Yes. So it seems we constantly <laughs> have been wanting the desire is evident mm -hmm. we have it but have we applied our time to the right priorities <laughs> no <laughs> we haven't no okay so so let's go into our hypothetical uh, space where I have the power to uh, hire you as a consultant to fix my small country called Ghana <laughs> What three things should we be applying our time to in terms of priority to stimulate this economic growth that we're desiring? Education. Mm. You've talked about education mm. a bit. Okay, so what other two? I would like to come back to education after that. I would love to say infrastructure, but let me break it down. Support. Okay. And an intentional mindset. These three things. It's quite interesting. So... Um, education mm -hmm. that will sit under institution mm -hmm. um, and then the, the mindset the is the people yes. okay so then the infrastructure resources so uh, people institution and resources we have these in abundance we have some great Ghanaian people I mean, but are we channeling them to the right so what would you change about our education there's been quite a lot of talk about our education not preparing people yes. and not challenging them to Enough. think outside the box. Yes. We theoretical. transition from the O-level uh, and A-level system to what we now have, the senior and junior high school. Yesterday I heard someone say, 
that was how we lost our way. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Um, yes and no. Okay. Yes, because I'm, I'm, I'm a product of the old, mm -hmm. the O and A level. So yes, I would support that. No, also because at some point we needed to change mm -hmm. and we needed to introduce a different way because we are not who we used to be. And you just can't get stuck in that. But what I think is that we shouldn't have our educational system pushing all our children to, the, to university. No, we shouldn't have to train them. I totally believe in everybody getting it, you know, obtaining a degree and mm -hmm. going through um, the process, seven apprenticeship and coming out. But you need to be able to have a type of education where you can identify entrepreneurs. There are a lot of people who dropped out of school because they just they didn't get it. They had all these ideas and they were going crazy. And so yet, grammar is not for everyone. It's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. And how do we identify that? We need to introduce a lot of mentoring and coaching, you know, sessions within our, our, our universities and our colleges, our schools, where people need to be mentored. You can get a lot out of them because not everybody is cut out for that. But because the options aren't there, we just go with it. I want to come out and be, a, 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 you know, a degree holder. Or what do you have? I graduated with this. I graduated, and then I'm, I'm, I'm unemployed. But along the way, they had ideas. They had, you know, all these ideas they wanted to, to turn into something. But there was nobody guiding them as to how to, you know, harness this and then, you know, turn it into something. At the time when you went to university, did you choose the course you wanted to study? at the university? Um, yes. Okay. What happened was when I won the, the Shivnin scholarship, the scholarship was just enough to go to um, some universities in London. Mm -hmm. But I wanted an MBA in banking and finance. And I chose Strathclyde University because it, it's a good school, it's a good business school. But of course, the amount that they needed um, to cover the tuition, the scholarship, so there were two um, options the university gave me. Was First of all, I was too young for the MBA program. They needed a certain uh, number of years of experience, and I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So I needed to prove to the university that I could do the course. So what happened was there, there was an exam I had to sit, and if I passed, I get a scholarship as well. I get a certain percentage of the tuition, mm -hmm. which added up. I, I tell you, my life is, is, is interesting. It's always... I wanted a party, I, I won the money, I did my party. Mm -hmm. And then I got the scholarship. The difference was, okay, so I, 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 I took the exam and I passed. So I got offered that discount and that was able to get me into Strathclyde okay. because then the, the, the money from Shivnin was, so that's how it started. And I, when I got there, there were two options. If I didn't make it or I didn't pass, then I needed to downgrade from an MBA to an MBM, okay. Masters in Business Management, mm -hmm. which was just, um, I think, a little and not lower. lower yes, than the not MBA, lower. Yeah. And I could then do the MBA after that. And I said, no, I wanted an MBA in banking and finance. I wasn't going to do an MBA. If I wanted an MBA, I would stick with one of the universities that you know they gave me. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'll do the exam. I went in, and I passed, and I got it. And just um, to cut everything short, I was the youngest in my MBA class, and I emerged the MBA student of the year for, 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 for my school that year. So you just have the knack of entering things, you know, <laughs> unconventionally and just blowing everyone out of um, the water. No. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was the youngest and also yeah. the only black girl in class. Wow. And then you so I needed, I needed to make a difference. I just needed to prove to them that even though I came in being the youngest, and you guys thought, okay, you needed to do this to prove to us that you could do it. I needed to come out with something else. Let's have a conversation mm. about women in a moment. Yes. Um, and, and your business, mm. Innovative Microfinance, yeah. is preaching this rather audacious <laughs> dream of financial freedom for all. But you're mm. focusing on women. And it's something I'd like us to explore. So okay. uh, when we come back from this break, uh, we'll go into that. Uh, my guest on the Executive Lounge today is uh, Sheila Zuntaba. She's a former uh, Miss Ghana in 1996, for those of you who don't know that. Uh, and uh, she is currently uh, the founder and CEO of Innovative Microfinance. And we'll be learning more about women 
um, entrepreneurship. We're also going to get her passion about financial freedom for all. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me, Inshira Addo, and my guest, Sheila Azuntaba. And uh, she's the CEO and founder of Innovative Microfinance, a uh, business that's preaching a very good news, financial freedom for all, focusing on uh, rural women. How did the idea of Innovative Microfinance come about, and, and why rural women at the moment? Hmm, okay. You know, I mentioned I worked with a uh, city group in Nairobi. So mm -hmm. right after Nairobi, I got posted to Lagos. Okay. And in Lagos, I was posted to head the Global Transaction Services. I was in Lagos for under three years. And um, after that, I resigned and came back to Accra. I, at that time, I didn't want to really work with any of the banks because I just had enough of the investment banking. And I remember I, my, for my project um, after my MBA, mm -hmm. I did this... Uh, document on how to help the northern women. I'm, in, I'm from the north and ultimately everything I do always goes back to, to what to do to help them. So I spent three months on this project and that was to help them and basically all they needed was to be given the tools, not only finance but the education, the training, you know, and then also the support to be able to do something for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I put that into my MBA paper and you know, put it somewhere. So when I came back, I immediately went back and picked it up and looked at it and thought, okay, how do we turn this into a business? Um, it didn't start out as straight in the north. It started out here helping friends and family um, with, um, you know, small seed capital for their businesses. I didn't spend a lot of time to do the research. So that got me into a little bit of trouble and we were not regulated then. So um, it was a free fall. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody owed me anything. I couldn't take anybody anywhere. So I had to regroup, and I realized that being an investment banker is totally different from microfinance. I mean, they're two different things. The only thing they have in common is finance. Mm. They're two different things. So I needed to speak to people who had the knowledge of microfinance. And then I went out, met a few guys who had been doing it. Some of them had gone to India for training and were working at the ministry of, um, a great ministry of finance. So I got together with them, and then we developed a model from my paper. We retweaked it. And then, okay, one of the things was, how do we then help women to the stage where they're sustainable? We create wealth but, uh, with a purpose, because okay. those were the two things I wanted to be able to do, where in creating wealth, I could do that with a purpose. And the only way I could do that was to help empower impact and then make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. Needed money, which we didn't have at that, at that time. The seed capital I'd put in was quickly being depleted. So I met, um, should I call him a philan philanthropic guy who I used to work with when I was a banker? Um, I shared the idea with him and he was like, I'm totally in. You know, I will do anything and especially, but with, on one condition that everything we do goes to support the Northern woman first before wow. any, yes. And this was then the um, MD of Wienko. And he said, everything I have done, I've worked in the North, and I see how hard these women, and I said, totally, I see it. But it's difficult because the resources needed, we just don't have them. So what I want to do is to start educating them first before we then even establish whether they are credit worthy or they are ready. Because a lot of the times we think that you just have to give them a loan. Mm -hmm. But not all the time. You just need to guide them. You know, basic financial literacy. Every woman I have met in the North and even here has two things. One is to change who they are today and to ensure that their kids don't end up being who they are. These are the two things every woman will tell you. So when we got that story, we told them, okay, we would help you be different. You should wake up and look at yourself and feel um, empowered, confident that with as little as 500 cities, you've been able to put your kid in school. And some of them would start with as little as 500 cities and then ultimately be able to put up a small uh, hut. You know, those are the things women want to know. And it would surprise you that a lot, some of these women that we have encountered are women in communities where they're probably married to the same man. Mm. You know, so you go into a community where there are four women married to the same man. But you see, 
they put aside the fact that we married the same one, rivalry, all of that. That is not really what, what matters to them. What matters to them is that I need to make sure my children do not end up like me. And when you have that and you tell them you're there to support, but you have to tell them it's not, there's no free lunch. Mm -hmm. It's not an NGO. You have to be responsible to whatever help I give you, just as much as I would be responsible to ensuring that it is sustainable. Mm. If you get that story across to the most deprived, illiterate woman, she'll buy into it. Because ultimately, for her, she needs to see that she's making a difference. So the, the, the things that they desire are very similar across the board. Everywhere. Um, either to the intervention of uh, innovative microfinance and, and your project, what were some of the challenges that they were facing and how, what learnings did you come to in trying to bridge the gap for them? I think the challenges they were facing are challenges we face. And I say it, it, it's relative because you may face it today and you think, oh, I'm the only person in it. But if you speak to that woman in the, in, in, in the rural community, she's facing the same challenges. Being taken seriously, mm. you know, um, seeing herself more than just a woman also, or a, a mother, Beth and kids, knowing that she has the potential, but selling herself short because she hasn't been given the platform to actually do something with herself. So the same things a lot of female entrepreneurs face today, they face it, but just that they are in grades. So what I face, so that's what I actually, that, should I say, did I feed into it or did they feed into mm -hmm. mine? But when I spoke to them, I was more comforted because the same things I wake up and I'm scared to leave my room are the same things they wake up and they're scared to leave. So you identified with their situation? Totally, totally. So looking back at your time at Echo Bank, City Group, um, you know, throughout your working uh, life prior to starting your entrepreneurial journey, did you feel at any point that you weren't taken serious? Um, of course, Stracklight thought that you were too young. So <laughs> that was did the you beginning. always have to jump through hoops to, to I, yeah. sit at the table? I have had to. And I just go back to even being a former beauty queen. You know, a lot of the times I've had to defend myself more and to actually convince people that I am more than just a former beauty queen. You know, I have more than... I have people ask me today who don't even know I have a degree, who would still look at me as, oh, so what are you doing? Or what do you do with your life these days after all the beauty, beauty? And I'm like, you know, it's been 22 years. A lot has happened. But it's, it's difficult. And, you know, we've got a lot of stereotypical minds, you know, who put you in a corner and they refuse to get you out of the corner even when you tell them this is not who I am you know see me this way so yes you have to jump through those hurdles and every time I've gone to raise financing for innovative microfinance I've spent more time trying to convince them that listen even though I'm a woman I've been a beauty queen and all of that I have more and I can turn this money around maybe even better than you giving this money to you know a guy you know, I've had to spend more time convincing them. And that has meant that I've had to make sure that Innovative has the proper structures in place, where when we go out there to seek financing, we don't have to talk. Our work and Speaks the people we partner with. So we've had to, if you notice, I've been a bit quiet, and you know, people have been wondering what I've been up to. But I've spent all these years trying to build a company that we would now have people wanting to come and partner with us instead of us going to partner with them. And we are not big, but we've got the proper structures in place. We've got a scalable product. And we, it's easily you know, tweaked, and we partner, we use technology. So it is easy for any company that wants to have access to the rural communities to talk to us first, because we've laid the foundation for that. And it takes a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice. How can women be heard more? What, what, what must society do? What must women do? to be heard more and to take their place at the table? Um, I think it, it's, it, it's in how we carry ourselves, what we do. Because a lot of the times we sell ourselves short. You know, I have met the most amazing women. Sometimes I sit there and I'm like, oh my God, I have to hide because these women, you know, awesome women, but nobody knows about them. 
and we don't have to wait for example for government to put that together for us mm -hmm. we as women have to start building ourselves up because a lot of the times men do that for themselves we don't do that we wait for men to say okay it's okay to join no we have to come together mm -hmm. and demand our place because we have so much to contribute that it would amaze you that if we came together and we sat at the table okay I Things won't say the rest. Yes. No, you should say the rest. <laughs> no, even you men would start to fight for your places. Wow, yes. I like that. Um, very audacious. And uh, so, so women must come together. Now, how should men or society in general, what, what must we do? What, what should happen to, I don't want to say to allow more women in, but, but more... To, to understand that, you know, the paradigm is changing and, and, and it's not going to be It's changing and it's really, really, really quick. Yeah. Um, I think we shouldn't say that we, should, we want men to allow us. No. Uh, if you were given the chance to say, okay, this is the door, come in, you will not allow. But we have to ensure that when that door opens, we are ready. It's that readiness, you know, we want it so badly. Mm -hmm. But in preparing ourselves to be ready, we need to put in more energy to ensure that when we do get offered that place at the table, we bring to the table what every man there is bringing. Mm -hmm. And that is the way we need to work on, to prepare ourselves to be ready, to be accepted. Because it's okay to be at the table, but will they take you? Will they think you're serious? You know, will they listen to you? You need to prepare before you get there. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll learn more from my guest, Eliza Untaba, as she talks to us about uh, women empowerment, uh, financial literacy, and the future of the African female entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me, Inshira Addo, and my guest, Sheila Zuntaba, CEO of Innovative Microfinance Limited. And uh, we've been learning quite a bit about her life, her lessons, the hurdles she's had to jump over and the hoops she's had to, you know, jump through just to have a seat at the table. Now, just before we went on that break, Sheila, you talked about, you know, that sometimes we, and you said we, and I'm believing you're talking about women, but generally Africans are believed to sell ourselves short. How do we fix that confidence deficit? No, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough one. But I think um, I see a lot of that changing in Ghana, where the number of female entrepreneurs is actually rising. I read, I think, two days ago that Ghana had the most um, female-owned businesses in the whole of Africa. Mm. Um, that alone is, is a fact that things are changing. Okay. And, you know, people are beginning to take up, you know, the role of an, uh, entrepreneurs as women. But then what I find out is a lot of these are tabletop, you know, very small uh, businesses where we do them and we structure them around the time, you know, where we can have time for the family, pick up kids from school. So we'd rather get off work and then start something because we have to fit that around, you know, being a mother, a wife. Mm. But we need to move from there where we need to start to think about owning industries. Mm. We, you know, we... As women, we have the strength to birth anything, you know, you, not biologically alone. We birth nations, we birth industries, we birth so many things. And we need to, you know, start thinking of bigger things than, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I'm looking down on tabletop businesses, but you can turn a tabletop business. I'll give you an example. I met a certain lady that who blew me away. This lady is into maize. You know, she's got a group of women and she's got a farm in the Volta region. Now, what she did was instead of um, just being on just one side of the value chain, she decided to own, own the entire value chain. Wow. So she's employed the women. The farmland is hers. She's gotten from the chiefs and she controls the quality of the maize. So she buys the inputs for the women to farm and then she's the off taker. And she uses that to produce a, uh, um, a, a cake and packages it well for all these shops. So when she came to us and told us her need, I mean, it was a no-brainer. I, I, I sat there, I said, you know what, we will support you. Because this is what we want to be able to see women do. Where if you go into a business, you study the value chain and you position yourself where you control 80% of the value chain. If you control 100, so be it. 
you know, there are students from Ashesi, five of them coming together, and they want to go straight into agri-farming from school. These are university students, and they can get employed by any company because, of course, you know, Ashesi is like one of the best. But they've chosen not to. They have a model, they've got a plan, and they're actively doing presentations and raising funds. So immediately after they graduate, they're going into agri-farming. The, the, you know, these are the things we want to see. And they're as young as 24, I don't mm. know what I was doing at 24, you know. <laughs> I was waiting to be employed by a bank. Yeah. And they are saying, no, we don't want to be employed. We want to employ, you know. So that is how we have to look at it, where the female entrepreneurs should start thinking beyond just the small things. And it has to, you know, I always go back to education. Mm -hmm. Education, education, education. And it's not just going to school. You know, mentoring, coaching is all part of educating mm -hmm. them and then strengthening them. But we have to come together to do that. So the need to be, um, you know, women coming together, together, like forming on a bit of an amalgamation, yes. sharing experiences mm -hmm. and having each other's back. Education is important, education as you say. Um, but financial literacy is, is something that, you know, um, is not gender specific and no. it's, it's, it's an equal opportunities offender um, both men and women need that help but still focusing on um, the rural woman mm -hmm. I'd like you to paint a picture of what you dream of the future of the rural female entrepreneur um, who's financially literate would look like that's the picture I painted Dreaming big. Yes. Building industries. Yes. The paddy rice farmers we fund in, 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 in northern region, where these women shouldn't only be the ones on the farms, but should be the off takers mm. and the ones who own the farms. You know, a lot of the times the farms are owned by the chiefs. So, yes, of course, we give them that. But you can get to a stage where that female entrepreneur is the one who employs the other women because it is only through that that they can actually give or share their experiences mm -hmm. because you've been there, you struggle together, you can share that. And that is where I see the rural female entrepreneur, you know, that's, that's what I, my, my vision and dream for them is that they should own the entire value chain. Now we talk about scaling up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you contend that your business is small, but <laughs> making uh, you know, strides to growth. Um, lots of businesses in Ghana, albeit owned by women, are quite small. In terms of how we go from small to medium to large industry or enterprises, what are maybe three key things that you think people ought to start doing now beyond coming together? Beyond coming together, one thing I would always say is it's okay to start small because you get to learn and you make all the mistakes and you regroup. It's okay, but don't stay stuck at being small just doing the same thing over and over again. But one thing we often fail, and a, a lot of the times when I speak to a few of the female SME uh, businesses, is the proper structures are put in place. It shouldn't take you to be a million CDs worth to finally hire an accountant, mm. or to have a proper bookkeeping, or to have your uh, financials done. Start from the very beginning. You know, and sometimes when you speak to, um, an entrepreneur who's just started a business, you ask them, how much are you paid? Like, oh, well, you know, the business hasn't picked up. No, you should know your worth right from the very beginning. If you think your, this business is going to be $10 million, you should price yourself at that. You may not be able to pay yourself that from the beginning, which you should give it, you should loan it out to the company, but you should make sure everything that you take out of the business is made sure it is for the business. So you pay yourself a salary from the beginning mm. and make sure you separate yourself from the business, meaning hire people to help you. You don't have to go get a big time accountant, no. The students, UPS, right? Mm -hmm. University UPSA, of Professors, that's right. UPS, who are willing to intern, you know, get one of them every week, let them put together your, 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 your books for you. You'll be amazed, I was talking to one, I said, you'll be amazed that at the end of the year, your business is worth something you, don't, you never even dreamt of. And you can use that to start to look for funding so you can grow. Because the only way you can grow is to get in capital. And for anybody to trust you, to invest in you, they need to see a track record. They need to see that when you say, I've been doing this since 2000, what's there to show? Mm. It's not the shop, it's not the edifice, no. What have you done so far? 
make sure you put all of these things in place mm -hmm. and employ people, get people. It costs money, but it takes money to get money. Mm -hmm. You know, it will cost you something today, but ultimately it will get you that funder that will give you the capital to get to your potential. So right from the beginning, put in place the right structures. Wonderful. Well, it's been an awesome time uh, talking to you. Time does fly when you're having a good time, but uh, I wish we could carry on. But I'd like to say a big thank you, <laughs> thank you, know, you uh, for making time to join us on the Executive Lounge. And here are my five takeouts uh, from this conversation. And um, it's all from Sheila's experiences and work and the places she's been and things she's done. And the first thing I think that we ought to pay attention to is do dream about good things. And when you do, take the smallest window of opportunity that uh, pops up for you. Um, she told you about how she decided to just, uh, go and try, and hand, try her hands at uh, the uh, regional final of uh, Miss Ghana and uh, she won, won the prize money and made her way to the final and became Miss Ghana in 96. The second thing is also that um, start small but have a big, big, big dream. Have a dream that scares you but start small and in starting small as you go along um, you can learn your way into becoming um, that big business that you want to be. But more importantly along the way to growth uh, which is the third thing, is don't be stuck when you fall. If you ever fall as you move, pick yourself up and start over again. You know, today, the lessons she learned from the initial uh, early life of her business is what's kept her structures better and stronger so that she can scale up and grow. The fourth thing is that um, together we're better. I'm alone when I work alone, but with you, we can do more. The power of synergy is something we need to learn to harness. Uh, and the final thing I'm taking away from this is that have passion. But it, passion should not be like a raging waterfall. You can clothe it in grace, which is something I see Sheila has done very well. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for and having to you. Me for watching. Uh, we'll come your way again with the Executive Lounge. Uh, thank you to the entire crew and to our friends at Villa Monticello. We'll be back again. For now, go forward, make rain. Shalom. <laughs>